Hello and welcome to Playing With Power, the, po- the retrospective podcast about Nintendo Power Magazine, the effect it had on our lives and our spending habits, and uh, some of the stuff we may have missed because we just didn't get the magazine soon enough or we were just kids and didn't appreciate it. Uh, so, with more adult minds, we comb over all the details, the awesomeness, and the failures, although hopefully not too many of those, of... The seminal player's strategy guide before GameFAQs came along and killed everything. (laughs) Nintendo Power Magazine. Today we're tackling issue four, which was January and February of 1989. And, well, we'll start with the cover. Well, let's, hold on, before we get there, let's start by introducing ourselves again. So I'm... Oh, crap. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Ben, your co-host, and I'm talking with Mike, our our other co-host. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, yes. We forgot who the hell we are. Yes. It, it, it was just. It was just unimportant, considering the the gravity of what we're uh, diving oh, into. I see. <laughs> All right. That's my safe. And a bit of housekeeping for everyone. If you want to follow along with us, uh, we are now posting uh, on our Facebook page, Play My Power Podcast. In advance of recording the episode, we'll post a link to the latest issue so you can go and download the scan at your leisure if you don't have an old copy of the magazine and uh, at the very least you can take a look at the cover of the of the scan of the magazine so in other words playing with power provides preview posts for your perusal but uh we will you you, it's not necessary for you to go and get that in order to follow along we will paint a picture with words through this audio format yep all right, without further ado, let's kick it off. This uh, issue is about all about Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, the blockbuster review. And the front cover, uh, I always actually really like this cover. It's got um, uh, it's a model of uh, Link shot in uh, a fake palace with a pair, appears to be a Princess Zelda sleeping, and he is all decked out with a big uh, feathery mullet and he's got a real shield on his back and he's got a glowing sword in his hand and he's wearing some kind of fishnet garb and uh yeah zelda looks like a um uh, a blow-up doll <laughs> i was gonna be a bit nicer and say mannequin but yeah and you know what link's doing <laughs> do i and she's got like hey. big old curly hair from it's like the, link. the 80s <laughs> It's like Link is some college frat douche, and he's like, hey, if she can't say no, oh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give her my oh, yeah. master sword. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how about you see me plunge a sword into something instead of out of it? hi yo. Yeah, so he's got the Arthurian shield with a golden cross on it and a uh, glowing sword. Yeah, I don't know why he's got the netting on instead of chainmail, but what the hell, he's, he makes it look all right. Yeah. And on the second page, we have a shelf of amazing power supplies, as they're called. Now, I have this exact shelf in my room, <laughs> and it surprised me just how old the design is. And uh, it's assorted controllers that we've covered, the Mega, the NES Max, the NES Advantage, the remote controller. But we have some new items. And uh, Oh, boy. Should we... Should we cover them now, or should we cover them when they're offered in the players' poll? Oh, no. We need to talk about them now, and then we'll remind okay. everyone that the players polled. Well, so. the first one I noticed is the <clears throat> Super Controller. Now, Ben, did you... Uh, <laughs> up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's... A Super Controller! It makes you think, like, when you look at this now... <laughs> when you look at this now, it makes me think, like, oh, did they have a Super Nintendo controller that was compatible with a Nintendo? No. And uh, this is made by Bandai. And you think it might be an actual controller by itself. It is not. It is, in fact, a lame case that goes on top of your existing controller. And the only thing it adds is a joystick on top of the D-pad. So if you want an extra D-pad thing or extra um, analog stick on top of your existing D-pad, which is wrapped in a case around your original controller, that is the Super Controller. Sounds wow, awesome, right? Sounds like, 
I think I'd rather just stick with the Ness Advantage because it's got turbo. You got your, you want your arcade stick? You're gonna get some extra firepower with that. But uh, this seems to be the super disadvantage. Yeah, I mean, the 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 form factor of it, the controller being small to fit in your hands, you're not gonna want to use a giant thumbstick, you know, with a four with a finger and thumb <laughs> to move around, right? <clears throat> no. And uh, the next product is the Roland Rocker. <laughs> so I wasn't uh, able to find a whole lot of, out about the Roland Rocker besides um, the angry video game nerds video about it. Um, <laughs> but it, it's pretty awful. So this is made by a notorious LJN, which is responsible for some of the most atrocious Nintendo games of all time. That's, the, that's, the, un- that's the uncle of notorious B.I.G. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so how it works is the the roll and rocker is essentially a giant D-pad that you stand on and you're supposed to rock it from side to side in order to move it up, down, left, right. And how do you control A and B and start and select? Well, By stomping it? By holding the control in your hand, of course. <laughs> Completely bypassing the need for an extra accessory. Right. <laughs> so oh my gosh. This, this thing like didn't work. Like hardly at all, not even with, with shitty LJN games, of course. So having this, you know, was a complete disadvantage and just a piece of plastic junk in your living room. Oh my gosh, I can just imagine, like, it's it's called the D pad, mm-hmm. but if you buy it, you're a D bag. <laughs> uh, next is the Zoomer joystick. Now this thing looks kind of nice. Now, please shatter my illusions. (laughs) I I don't know if it's uh, any good or not. I I watched a video of someone speaking Spanish uh, that he was playing either a Top Gun game or a game like Top Gun, and he was using it. uh, So was it it bueno or was it malo? Uh, It looked okay. I mean, you move the the whole contraption left, right, up, down to mimic the D-pad, and on the triggers uh, on the top of the, the two individual joysticks, you have um, buttons for A and B. And what's so nice it, about that is you actually there's actually dials at the bottom to adjust the turbo settings for both of those. Interesting. So so it doesn't really... It's not a complete pile of crap if, if it seems to do what it says it does. Yeah, it's just limited to limited application to flight sim games, and it assumes that A and B are mapped to things that shoot at things, Right. I would I would love to see someone try to play Mario or Zelda with this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and next is the wireless ultimate super stick, which uh, I'm looking at this, and this obviously looks like the goofy virginal precursor to the N64 controller. <laughs> virginal? Why is it virginal? Listen, if you look that dorky, would you get any action? <laughs> no, it's not sleek. It ain't sexy, and it sure as hell knows it. Yes, it is. It, it it is the George McFly of controllers. <laughs> it's George, it it has a uh, the funny thing about this thing when I looked up the video of this this one, uh, it's got suction cups on the bottom of it, so it sticks to a table, I guess. And the wireless works the same way that the remote controller from Acclaim does, where you have to have direct line of sight infrared access. So I guess I don't, I don't know why you would make this thing wireless. Um, if you have to stick it down to a table to make sure it doesn't move. Um, and the ultimate part about it just means that it has turbo buttons and you can adjust the turbo with the knobs. Um, so I see like four, I only see four buttons on those things. Yeah, it's got, it's got a set of A and B buttons on either side of a central joystick. So they're not additional buttons. They're just, if you're right-handed, you can, you know, you can use, I, I don't know, the 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 stick on the right hand side or left hand side and your buttons on your right or if you're left handed you know that kind of thing oh my gosh whereas yeah, this is, the NES advantage so, is for people that are left handed or right handed excuse me uh this like again like this goes to show that they had that this wasn't a rush decision when the N64 was created they'd been sitting on this design before and were just waiting for the moment to bring it back they were waiting because, for the moment that's, that's, when it would actually made sense for a video game console that could support it. 
and even then it was friggin' awful, <laughs> as they as, as they demonstrated with the uh, GameCube controller, which was still like an awkward second puberty until they finally came out with the Wii controller and just like, all right, this is how you do a friggin' controller. Right. While Sony and PlayStation just pretty much, they said like, you know what? PlayStation nailed it the first time. We'll just add an extra stick and just, you know, don't mess with perfection. Yeah. They're just like, let's just Meanwhile, make the design ergonomic now so it actually feels good to people's hands. Yeah, because, like, if you've got a hand in the middle of the controller, you're missing what's on the side. Yeah. Oh, my so, gosh, yeah. Ugh, N64, friggin' awful controller. <laughs> it's okay once you get used to it, but, yeah, it, the whole three three sticks you have to hold on to, it never made any sense to me. <laughs> Next is this month's Howard and Nestor. Uh, Nestor arrives at the Track and Field 2 Olympics. He shows up and he ruins two athletes' concentration by asking where the coach is. And the pole vaulter snaps his stick, and I imagine if he's not dead, he's at least paralyzed. Uh, the diver just belly flops and must be in excruciating pain. Eventually, he finds the room, and the coach is everyone's favorite asshole, Howard. He shows up, and Nestor is disappointed. Now, I'm surprised that he's surprised, since Howard should have followed. Howard should have just surprised him by following him on the damn plane and telling him everything, like he usually does. Now, Howard asks Nestor if he wants to warm up for the triple jump, and Ness has to dodge an errant discus that is just, like, tossed at near him and ends up near him, and he thinks that Howard planned it. Uh, I can't rule that out, but I can't trace it back to him either at this point. Now, Howard offers to help Ness up, and Ness thanks him, but in his head, for nothing. Howard then explains all the degrees keep the jumps at like you got to keep the first two jumps between 55 and 65 degrees and the last jump shouldn't be more than 80 degrees and most important your timing is critical Nestor decides to show him how it's really done and somehow trips at the finish line and then Howard shows up with a shovel and in my estimation it's just to finish him off with his head stuck in the sand <laughs> so and, I, uh, this is the first Howard and Nestor comic I actually laughed at and I enjoyed um, and partly is because Howard Phillips isn't being such a pretentious asshole. He's actually trying to help in this one. Um, and and uh, Nest, Nestor is ignoring him, right? The funny thing about yeah. it for me is that reading his advice about the angles between the jumps is wrong, according to their own advice in Nintendo Power in the previous issue. They say you should try <laughs> to be at 45 degrees for each jump. <laughs> so he's oh even giving him gosh. bad advice in this. Uh <laughs> <laughs> so I was right. He is an asshole. Uh, either that, or he's just misinformed. But who knows? I don't know. A guy that dresses that smart usually knows what he's doing. <laughs> he could be just effing with him. <laughs> Nestor does make a good punching bag. He does. Uh, All right. Moving on is... to counselor's corner. Now I've got something to say about the agents, but do you have anything to say about the games? Because I really don't. <laughs> Game, yeah, I wanted to covered. mention uh, the GoGo13 piece. So it says, how do I get through the bases? How do I advance past Greece? And uh, what's funny is they have almost like a hand-drawn map in here, and they literally tell you in the instructions, when you go through these mesas, use a pencil to point to the wall on the map that you are facing and move the pencil when you change your position. Like this is this is part of the this is part of the game apparently is you have to draw out where the hell you are when you go through a maze. Oh my gosh! Make your own map. Just show me one on the screen, damn it. Yeah, I mean it, this is you know the kind of uh, work that's involved in getting through this game. Apparently, uh, we talked about it last time, but um, they, apparently there's other other places to enter besides subways, uh, which I did not realize. For example, there's a screenshot of of a, a space between two bushes. Where apparently you can walk in between, so hmm. <clears throat> you have to either use a walkthrough or just guess randomly where you can try and walk up through somewhere, and then it's now, a maze this, apparently after that. Does this make you reconsider getting a little bit of uh, a little bit of extra help to try to continue <laughs> no. thirteen? Or are you done with it? <laughs> no, I'm done with it. After I got stuck in the game and there was no way to proceed, I'm like, all right, they had their shot. Not going, not going through this again. Okay, now I mentioned before that there may be some shady goings on mm -hmm. and the uh, the council's corner. 
Now, it's funny that they're called agents when it's Counselor's Corner, but, you know, mm -hmm. that's not part of the uh, the mystery. Uh, well, now we've got we at least off, two people with uh, unibrows so far. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to them. And uh, three agent, with mustaches. <laughs> agent, agent 59 is Jim Muller. His hobbies are computer, investment analysis, and apparently fronting a 70s AM radio band. And, uh, uh, he looked the his, most normal of all of them, I think. With, with, with his uh, blonde brown hair and beard, he kind of reminds me of a certain co-host I know. <laughs> I was going to say, this guy's fairly handsome, thank you very much. I mean, he seems a little handsome and distinguished and, uh, you know, well kept together. <laughs> Next, Agent, agent uh, 4, oh, Cliff Jesus. Hammond. His hobbies include sports, arcades, and playing my Ness. And wearing and your skin. And, and having the name of a soap opera character, Cliff Hammond. He's got uh, an insane unibrow going on. Like he has no concept of what's going on. And a really disgusting, like, perv stash. I mean, he just looks greasy. Is all hell. With, oh yeah, with the uh, with the unibrow and the mustache, he looks like he looks like the level of a platformer game. <laughs> uh, next is Agent Two Eighty Nine. Uh, his gaming accomplishment is the first at Nintendo Power to beat GoGo Thirteen, which is also his favorite game. Now he's balding, with brown hair, middle aged, and has a dad stash. I swear we saw this guy last issue. This, no, Agents. that's not a dad's dash. It looks like someone, he's su permanently suffering from uh, a dirty Sanchez. <laughs> next, is Agents, next is Agent 726, Brian Taney. He beat Metal Gear in one day. Now he's balding with brown hair, middle-aged, and a dad stash. I swear we saw this guy last Agent. <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess Steve Pennington must have got some water on himself because now he's multiplying and the evidence is immutable. Yeah. Dads are dads are taking over Nintendo power either to undermine its coolness or to try to relate to their kids. Either way, this is upsetting to the natural order. Let's see. My favorite part about Brian Tanny is he has like this shirt on, which is open, and you can just see his like chest sticking out from it. Oh, oh yeah, classy. it's just like... And he has this ladies. look on his face. He's like, hello, ladies. <laughs> Come uh, and take a look at my comb over in three years. 